Hello doctors, this is Dr. Hira Salman. Very good evening to all of you. So today we are going to start session 1 of Nephrology from MTB Step 2 CK 5th edition. So let's start. Diagnostic test in Nephrology. See the best initial test in Nephrology. We all know we have to know about the best initial test, the most accurate one and the next best step. These are very important points. So the best initial test in Nephrology, whatever topic we are going to cover, the best initial will be urinalysis and the blood urine nitrogen and creatinine. So this bun and this urine analysis is considered to be the best initial test whatever in nephrology uh, we are going to learn then we will see that we are going to do this uh, urinalysis and blood urine nitrogen and creatinine as initial testing now what do we mean by urinalysis urine analysis or urinalysis measures chemical reactions associated with protein white blood cells that is direct microscopic examination of wbc's we are going to see or leukocyte e stress dipstick test we can also do so wbc's or leukocyte e stress that includes in urinalysis, red blood cells cast, we are going to check a specific gravity and pH, nitrides. So whenever there are nitrides in urine, it indicates presence of gram-negative bacteria on dipstick. So that's very important clue. Whenever the patient is having an infection inside or gram-negative infection, that we can easily conclude on the basis of nitrides positive in urinalysis. So protein, WBCs, red blood cells, specific gravity, pH, and the presence of nitrides that we can all come to know with the help of this urinalysis. Urinalysis is two parts. First is dipstick if positive and second is microscopic analysis. So we can go for the dipstick and we can go for the microscopic analysis. So it consists of two parts. The dipstick gives some quantitative values as well. This means it is not just positive or negative but can give an approximation of the quantity of the protein. So it's not like that we will see only that this dipstick is positive or dipstick is negative but we can have some numbers associated with it. Say for example, WBCs and red blood cells and protein we can imagine say for example this can be described either as direct number for example 300 milligram protein or a scale of 0 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 1 plus means that more than 1 gram 2 plus means then 2 gram 3 plus means then 3 gram so these are all and 300 milligram protein so these are zero means because normally like uh, Hoffman uh, Tom Hoffman proteins we have normally in the urine that's only in between 30 to 50 milligram up to 300 it's okay but uh, when we go upward or more than 300 then we are going to see scaling system plus one plus two and plus three so tip for us here is do not worry about knowing the precise scale every assembly step to seek it has come with the range of normal values attached so you will be able to assess severity so that is okay we don't need to learn the values or the norm but we have an idea we should have an idea about the normal values but it's always written in the exam so don't worry about learning the values now protein it is normal to excrete a very tiny amount of protein and the tubules secrete slight amount of protein normally known as stem horsepell protein. So this is the normal protein and we usually see this amount of protein that is approximately less than 150 milligram per 24 hours that is usually present in urine. Greater amounts of protein can be associated with either tubular disease or glomerular disease. So one can see if there is high amount or greater amount of protein, maybe more than 150 milligram per 24 hours, we can say that it's a tubular disease or it's a glomerular disease. That's why the patient is having normal time horsepower protein levels high. That is more than 150. Very large amount of protein can only be excreted with glomerular disease. So whenever there is a glomerular disease, definitely we are going to see large amount of protein excreted in urine. So if patient is having large amount of protein in urine, it means that the patient must be having some glomerular or tubular disease inside. Severe protein urea means glomerular damage. So if we see large amount of protein in urine, it means that it is an indicator that the patient is having glomerular damage. Now in terms of protein urea, the problem with using the scale of tray through 4 plus is that urinalysis measure only the amount of protein excreted at a particular moment in a day. In the day, it does not give an average or total amount of protein excreted over 24 hours because renal function itself varies during the day based on bodily position and physical activity. So it's it's obvious, you know, on in 24 hours you are not going to see when we do exercise, right? And at that particular time, more amount of protein is excreted in urine. So it's not it's not mean that the patient is having any kidney damage or any glomerular disease. That's a natural body physiology that during a stone or heavy exercise proteins are usually excreted more in urine so 
transit protein urea is present in 2% to 10% of the population. So this is also transit protein urea normally it's sucking in 2 to 10% of population. While most of this being, being benign without representing pathologies. There must be them. There are times when there is no pathology and we can see transit protein urea in those patients. If protein urea persists and is not related to prolonged standing that is orthostatic protein urea a kidney biopsy should be performed so that is important if you see a patient who is presenting with recurrent protein urea definitely what you are going to do and it's not related to prolonged standing there is nothing history related to prolonged standing that is known as orthostatic protein urea then we should do kidney biopsy in order to evaluate whether the patient is having any kidney pathology or not so standing and physical activity increases urine, urinary protein excretion. That's a normal body physiology. That's normal. When the patient is doing heavy or stoneless exercise and when the patient is having prolonged standing uh, history, then you can say the normal, normally the protein is excreted more in urine. Assuming constant protein excretion throughout the day, 1 plus protein is about 1 gram excreted per 24 hours. So that's that's very simple or uh, you know to memorize this thing that 1 plus means 1 gram, 2 plus means 2 gram, 3 plus means 3 gram. So and so on 4 plus means 4 grams so the two method to assess the total amount of protein in a day are so if you want to assess the protein uh, total amount of protein in a day so you have two methods either you can go for the urine dipstick and urine dipstick for protein so if you're going for the urine dipstick that dipstick is only going to detect albumin that is very important only albumin can be detected on the basis of urine dipstick point to ponder here Second thing, single protein to, no, this is the continuation, single protein to creatinine ratio and 24 hour urine collection. So these two methods, these two methods, this these boxes are actually point to ponder you just need to memorize it maybe it's, it's sometime it is relevant to the topic or it's sometime it's not relevant but these boxes are actually points to ponder so for especially in a daytime period if you want to know the total amount of protein we can go for the single protein to creatinine ratio or we can check the 24 hour urine collection so we have two methods either we can go for the spot protein to creatinine ratio or we can go for the 24 hour urine collection these tests are considered equal in accuracy however since the 24 hour urine is much harder to collect it is really performed but we usually do in hospital settings right normal protein is less than 150 milligram per 24 hours that is damn horse fall protein right so it should be if the patient is not having any disease the protein should be less than 150 milligram per 24 hours so normal protein per 24 hours should be less than 150 now tip for us is to assess protein urea your analysis is the initial test so whether the patient is having protein urea or not we will always go for urinalysis and urinalysis is considered to be the best initial test now protein to creatinine ratio is more accurate at determining the amount so if we want to check the amount we can go for protein to creatinine ratio that is more accurate at determining the amount now protein to creatinine ratio of one is equivalent to one gram of protein on a 24 hour urine so it's now it's it's values like if say for example if this protein to creatinine ratio is one we will say that this is one gram of protein on a 24 hour urine if the protein to creatinine ratio of 2.5 that is equivalent to 2.5 gram of protein if the ratio can be superior in accuracy to a 24 hour urine so this protein to creatinine ratio can be superior in accuracy so it's far better not to go for the 24 hour urine collection you can easily go for the protein to creatinine ratio because of technical difficulties in collecting a full day's worth of urine if you collect a little less it will underestimate the true excretion so uh, definitely it's wholesale based on patients so there are more chances of error if you add a single extra urination you might overestimate the protein estimation so that's very important and because of technical diffi diffi difficulties we usually go for protein to creatinine ratio testing that is considered to be you know more accurate or superior in accuracy to a 24 hour urine collection 
Now tip for us is if both protein to creatinine ratio and 24 hour urine are in the choices. Now if you have a question who is asking what is the best way or what is the best method either you are going for the 24 hour urine uh, protein testing or you go for the protein to creatinine ratio. So definitely which one is more accurate? The more accurate is protein to creatinine ratio and it is faster and technically easier to perform. So for our for our you know, exam point of view we will choose this protein to creatinine ratio. No, no doubt that 24 hour is best initial one but in, in order to choose if you have both option and they ask you which one is better so in that case you will go for protein to creatinine ratio then biopsy determine the cause of protein urea so that will be the most accurate one because on doing by doing biopsy you will definitely come to know what is actually the cause of protein urea so if you want to know the cause that is the most accurate one and that is biopsy so best initial testing is your analysis you will go for the 24 hour urine collection you will go for the for the more accurate one you will go for the protein to creatinine ratio for the most accurate one you will have this biopsy now we're coming towards microalbumin urea the presence of tiny amounts of protein that are too small to detect on the urinalysis is called microalbumin urea so these are very tiny amount of proteins that are too small to detect on the urinalysis you won't be able to detect it on urinalysis this is very important to detect in diabetic patients and long term so it's important in diabetic patients all right long term microalbumin urea just one minute okay long term microalbumin urea leads to worsening renal function in diabetic patient and should be treated so if it's a long term definitely it's going to worse the renal function or especially if it's a, if the patient is having diabetes so in those patients the kidneys are usually compromised and there's diabetic nephropathy so we have to treat that be aware that less than 30 milligram on spot urine is normal so if you're seeing any patient who ha who has this uh, spot urine that is uh, less than 30 milligram uh, you know protein is there it means that this is normal so microalbumin urea means that the one thing which is in between 30 to 300 so the value should be in between 30 to 300 milligram per 24 hours then we will say this is microalbumin urea a diabetic patient is evaluated with a urinalysis that shows no protein microalbumin urea is detected level between 30 and 300 milligram per 24 hours what is the next best step in the management of this patient what you're going to do see he is diabetic you need to evaluate each and every you know point of this question so see it's a diabetic patient so diabetic patient with a urinalysis that shows no protein so on urinalysis there is no protein but there is microalbumin urea which is detected and the levels in between 30 to 300 milligram that's why they are saying this is microalbumin urea what is the next best step there are they are not asking you the best initial one they are not asking you the most accurate one they are asking you what is the next best step in the management of this patient so next best step here either you're going to start in allopril that is acis kidney biopsy hydrolysine renal consultation low protein diet or repeat your analysis and will treat when trace protein is detected so your next best step will be you know the levels you you know that you, your patient is diabetic you know your patient's level is in between 30 to 300 that is he is presenting with microalbumin urea your next best step will be you're going to start medication and that is ACIs ACI inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers for example losartan or velsartan is the best initial therapy for any degree of protein urea in diabetic patients so you, you are trying to make a note of it that those diabetic patients if they have microalbumin, microalbumin urea so it's far better to start immediately put your patient on ACIs that is considered to be the best initial therapy they decrease the progression of proteinuria and delay the development of renal insufficiency in diabetic patients so this is the whole thing that they were actually by starting this ACI inhibitor what do we do we actually decrease the progression of proteinuria and delay the development of renal insufficiency in diabetic patients so in order to prevent the renal insufficiency in order to prevent the progression of proteinuria we usually advise medications immediately immediately when patient is diabetic and he is showing microalbumin urea 
why not we are using hydrolyzine because hydrolyzine is not as effective and has more adverse effects so we, we don't go for that the one who is having more adverse effects why should we use it as a best initial as a best next step right low protein diets are less effective than ACI inhibitors so we will advise but it's not the thing that we can only ask for the patient to do we will definitely go for the ACI inhibitors do not consult for initiating medications like ACI inhibitors we can start it by our own now Benz Jones protein and myeloma now this is point to ponder here the point to ponder here is Benz Jones protein in myeloma is not detectable okay Azan is here just give me two minute please okay let's continue so see Benz Jones protein this is point to ponder box here Benz Jones protein in myeloma is not detectable on a dipstick use immunoelectrophoresis so that's the protein Benz Jones protein which is usually present in multiple myeloma patient that is not detectable on a dipstick you can't find this Benz Jones protein on a dipstick and then we, you sh we should go for immunoelectrophoresis in that case that's only a point to ponder here now we're coming towards WBCs. White blood cells detect inflammation that we all know, infection or allergic interstitial nephritis. If it's a case of allergic interstitial nephritis, if it's any case of infectious diseases or inflammation, definitely WBC body defenders counts are raised. You cannot distinguish neutrophils from eosinophils on a urinalysis. Neutrophils indicate infection. They are considered to be the first line body defenders, but on doing urinalysis, you can't say this is neutrophil and you, this is eosinophil until unless you go for the microscopic evaluation. Eosinophils indicate allergic or acute interstitial nephritis. If it's a case of acute interstitial nephritis, definitely you're going to see eosinophilia. If it's a case of, you know, bacterial infection, mostly neutrophils counts are high. So it is very useful if eosinophils are found because of their specificity because they are mostly present in allergic conditions. So whenever there is any allergic disease in a body, 
you are going to see increased amount of eosinophil in that patient. It is less important if they are absent because the sensitivity of the test is limited. Microscopic examination gives a precise numerical count of the number of white blood cells present. Persistent WBC on urine analysis with negative culture can be TB. So this is just for our knowledge that if you are going to see continuously there is increased number of WBC on urine analysis but you are not going to see anything on culture that is negative culture despite of having continuously increase in WBC count that we can always think of TB that's important point here answers induced now point to ponder this this box point to ponder answers induced renal disease does not show eosinophil so answer induced renal disease if it's because of the use of answers non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs we can say that definitely it's because of the answers so you are not going to see new high neutrophil in uh, eosinophil counts in these patients eosinophils you can only see in a case of allergic condition in a case of interstitial nephritis so no nitrites in wbc on urine analysis it means that there is no infection because we have already done this that nitrites means that something gram negative bacteria is inside right but if there are no nitrites and no wbc's it means that no infection and no inflammation inside now tip for us is this right in hand cell stains detect eosinophils in the urine so this staining a special staining this right in hand cell staining it detects eosinophils in the urine and they are the answer for allergic interstitial nephritis if you want to know that this is all because of eosinophils so how we are going to detect it on the basis of staining that is right in hand cell stain and then we can say clearly if this stain is positive it means that eosinophils are there and if eosinophils are there that means it's a case of allergic interstitial nephritis now we're coming towards hematuria hematuria normal urine analysis has less than 5 rbc's per high power feet hematuria is indicative of so when we are going to see more than 5 rbc's in urine if it's a case of stones in bladder ureter or kidney if there are stones in bladder ureter or kidney it means that the patient might be presenting with more than 5 rbc's in his urine hematology disorders that cause bleeding so if there is any hematological disorder that is coagulopathy we can say yeah this is hematuria if it's a case of infection mostly in case of cystitis patient usually complain of this hematuria in case of pyelonephritis we can see this hematuria in case of cancer of bladder ureter or kidney they can also present with this hematuria do not use the urinalysis to screen for bladder cancer definitely for the screening purpose we can never use urinalysis this is the best initial one not the test to for the screening purpose now treatment is cyclophosphamide gives hemorrhagic suicide now sometimes because of the use of the treatment say for example if we are using cyclophosphamide and that can induce hemorrhagic cystitis so some medications they are also responsible for creating this hematuria so if, if we are using cyclophosphamide that will give hemorrhagic cystitis and because of that we can see hematuria in our patients now trauma trauma simply banging the kidney or bladder makes them shed red blood cells of course so because of trauma if there is history of trauma there may be hematuria and glomerular nephritis this is one of the cause of hematuria so these are all the causes of hematuria now point upon the here is ig nephropathy is common for mild recurrent hematuria if your patient is having iga nephropathy this patient usually present with recurrent but mild hematuria so they are also presenting with hematuria so there are lots of lots of causes of hematuria we have to evaluate one by one if we want to you know, exclude our patient from for a particular disease now false positive tests for hematuria on dipstick are caused by hemoglobin or myoglobin or ascorbic acid false positive tests for hematuria See, it's false positive on dipstick are caused by hemoglobin or myoglobin or ascorbic acid. These are not RBCs actually. These are hemoglobin or myoglobin or ascorbic acid. They can, you know, they can just give this false positive result on dipstick. And they're pertaining that the patient is having hematuria, but actually that hematuria is not because of RBCs. It's because of hemoglobin, myoglobin or ascorbic acid. That's why they're saying this is false positive. 
A woman is admitted to hospital with trauma and dark urine. The dipstick is markedly positive for blood. What is the best initial test to confirm the etiology? Now, here you know it's a clear case of trauma, right? So, if it's a case of trauma, how you're going to confirm the etiology? They are asking you the best initial test. So, best initial, initial test will be microscopic examination of the urinocystoscope, your renal ultrasound or renal bladder CT or X-ray myelogram. So, remember in best initial, we will choose the lighter or the lightest one. So, here is microscopic examination of urine. So, hemoglobin and myoglobin make the dipstick positive for the blood, but no RBCs are seen on microscopic examination of the urine. So, we can have the false positive result because of hemoglobin and because of, uh, you know, uh, especially because of hemoglobin and myoglobin, we can have this uh, dipstick positive, but it's not mean that RBCs are there. Maybe they are not RBCs. They are, you are not going to see any RBC on microscopic examination. That's why we are saying this is true, false positive result. Abdominal X-ray are abdominal. Sorry, abdominal X-ray detects small bowel obstruction ileus, but is very poor at detecting stones or cancer. So definitely, or with the help of X-ray, you won't be able to detect stones or cancer. That can only give you a clue for the obstruction. If it's a case of uh, you know small bowel obstruction or ileus, you can see on the basis of abdominal X-ray, but not the stones or cancer. Renal CT is the most accurate test. That is not the best initial one. That is the most accurate. Test. They're not asking you the most accurate, they're asking for the best initial one. So that, that's why it's excluded. Renal CT is the most accurate test for stone, but would not be done under the etiology of the positive dipstick had been confirmed as blood. So definitely we'll go for the positive dipstick test. Then only we can perform the most accurate test. First of all, we need to go for the best initial, then the next best step, and then the most accurate test in order to make a final diagnosis. Now, tip for us is intravenous pilogram is always wrong. It is slower and the contrast is renal toxic. So, we'll never go for intravenous pilogram or pilography. Why? Because the dye or the contrast media which we are going to use for this procedure that is actually nephrotoxic. So, we are not going to go for this. Usually a wrong answer. Now, tip for us is when dysmorphic red blood cells are described, the correct answer is glomerular nephritis. Whenever you're going to see in your question, if it's like dysmorphic word is written, it means that they're asking you to think about glomerular nephritis because in glomerular nephritis, we usually see this dysmorphic cells. Now, when is cystoscopy the answer? When you're going to say, yeah, we, uh, answer should be cystoscopy. The answer is cystoscopy when there is hematuria without infection or prior trauma. There is no history of trauma. There is no history of infection. Still, your patient is having hematuria. You should be quite suspicious about it and you should go for the cystoscopy. The renal ultrasound or CT does not show an etiology. Bladder sonography shows a mass for possible biopsy. So, renal ultrasound or CT does not show an etiology. Definitely in this case. And bladder sonography shows a mass for possible biopsy. Also, in that case you should go for the cystoscopy if you are, if you are going to see any mass you will go for the cystoscopy if you are if you are seeing on ultrasound uh, or renal ultrasound CT if, if there is nothing to show about any uh, you know regarding any etiology definitely you will proceed towards cystoscopy so cystoscopy is the most accurate test of the bladder see it's clearly mentioned it is the most accurate test of the bladder now we're coming towards scars. These are microscopic collections of material clogging up the tubules and being excreted in the urine. So these are all about the collection of material. These are cast and they're clogging up the tubules and being excreted in the urine. So cast are very helpful if found, but they are often not present. So you're not going to see cast all the time, but if they're there, so it will definitely make you new, make you help in the, making the diagnosis. Now, the type of urinary cast and their significance. Say, for example, type of cast, if we are seeing this red blood cell. So, red blood cell, you should always think of this glomerular nephritis. If you are seeing WBCs, it means that it's a case of pyelonephritis. Sorry about it. Yeah. So, red blood cells, glomerular nephritis, WBCs, if it's there, it means it's a case of pyelonephritis. If you're going to say ears in a fills, it means that you should consider any acute or allergic interstitial nephritis. The word allergic is very important and very specific for ears in a fills. 
higher line if you see higher line cast it means that dehydration concentrates the urine and the normal tam horse poi protein precipitates or concentrates into a cast so that is nothing it's actually our normal urinary protein which is normally in between 30 to 50 mg we can see on less than 150 mg this uh, normal tam horse poi protein that you can see that actually precipitate because of dehydration and uh, precipitate and or concentrate into a cast and that is known as higher line so that is actually normal thing right and that shows that patient is having dehydration now if you see broad waxy so that is high, this is high line broad waxy so if it's broad waxy so it means it's a chronic renal disease it's pertaining towards a chronic renal disease if you see granular or muddy brown cast that it means it's a case of acute tubular necrosis and there are collection of dead tubular cells so if it's a granular or muddy brown cast so it's pertaining towards the acute tubular necrosis so it's giving you a clue that this is a case of atn and there are collection of dead tubular cells that that is presenting in a form of granular muddy brown cast now tip for us is the presence of cast help answer the most likely diagnosis question because they are very specific say for example this cast this granular muddy brown cast is very specific for atn so if it's if it's cast is positive definitely you will think you will be thinking of this atn acute tubular necrosis Now we are starting with the first injury that is acute kidney injury acute kidney injury aki formally called acute renal failure so that is in another word whether you are going to say aki or you are going to say arf means the same thing which you may encounter as a synonym it's defined as decrease in creatinine clearance resulting in a sudden rise in blood urea nitrogen and creatinine so whenever there is increase in bun increase in bun is known as azotemia So, if there is increase in bun and creatinine, and you are going to see decrease in creatinine clearance, that is actually AKI or ARF. The definition is not based on a specific number of bun and creatinine. For etiology purpose, we are going to categorize AKI into three types. There are three types. First is pre-renal azotemia before. you know coming into the renal system we can say that if there is increase in in pathologies before kidney then we can say pre renal azotemia it's increase in blood urea nitrogen and creatinine because of decreased perfusion of the kidney we are going to see that is pre renal if there is any obstruction in uh, throughout the kidney or uh, this renal system we can say this post renal azotemia and if there is intrinsic renal disease that is only inside the kidney if there is pathology that may be because of ischemia that may be because of toxins we can say this is intrinsic renal disease. disease so before kidney after kidney and inside the kidney so it's pre renal post renal and intrinsic we are going to see as a team that is increased number of blood urea nitrogen and creatinine that is known as azotemia increase in bun plus creatinine now we are coming towards pre renal azotemia so if it's pre renal azotemia these are problems of inadequate perfusion of the kidney so kidneys actually are not adequately perfused there is ischemia there is low blood supply of the kidney in which the kidney itself is normal kidney itself is normal the only thing is that the blood is not going properly in kidney so because of you know less amount of blood there will be ischemia inside the kidney any cause of hypoperfusion or hypovolemia will raise the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine so definitely if we don't know we and we here we are not concerned about the cause but any cause which can cause hypoperfusion or hypovolemia that will result in increased number of blood urea nitrogen and creatinine and with the bone rising more than the creatinine definitely we are going to see this azotemia and this is pre renal it may be because of hypertension hypertension is systolic below 90 from sepsis maybe it's a case of sepsis in that case you are going to see prerenal azotemia there will be increased blood urea nitrogen but it doesn't like the any pathology related to the kidney it's all because of prerenal thing anaphylaxis can also cause bleeding dehydration in all of these cases you are going to see prerenal azotemia cause is not inside the kidney but because of the less perfusion of kidneys we are going to see all these things and hypertension especially now hypovolemia in case of hypovolemia say for example with the use of diuretics so if the patient is on diuretic more and more amount of water will be excreted out and the patient may become hypovolemic right or in a case of burn suddenly very large amount of water will be uh, removed from the body in a case of burn in that case we will see this hypovolemia and in case of pancreatitis also there is hypovolemia so in all that case hypovolemia and hypertension can lead to increase in blood urea nitrogen and creatinine and this is considered to be pre renal azotemia 
in case of renal artery stenosis see even though the blood pressure may be high the kidney is under perfused because the blood pressure is high blood pressure is high kidneys kidney arteries they are stenosed and they are not getting enough perfusion for the renal system right so although the blood pressure blood pressure even though is raised but perfusion is less inside the kidney so that is one of the cause of prerenal azotemia then relative hypovolemia from decreased pump function say for example if there is congestive heart failure if there is constrictive pericarditis or if there is tamponade history or there is hypoalbuminemia so relate, relative hypovolemia relative hyper hypovolemia because of any cardiac pathology related to congestive heart failure or pericarditis or tamponade in all these conditions there will be hypovolemia and because of hypovolemia there will be ischemia of the there will be less perfusion of the kidneys and thereby you are going to see pre-renal azotemia then if it's a case of hypoalbuminemia hypo low albumin in the blood it can also lead to pre-renal azotemia cirrhosis in cirrhotic patient also we can see this azotemia and that is pre-renal and cells constrict the afferent arteriole thereby causing the ischemia of the kidney and can lead to pre-renal azotemia ac inhibitors cause efferent arteriole vasodilation so efferent is dilated again there will be ischemia behind so definitely it will cause pre-renal azotemia so these are all the multiple causes of pre-renal azotemia now we are coming towards post renal azotemia post renal means obstruction of any cause damages the kidney by blocking filtration at the glomerulus see here the obstruction of any cause we there may be any cause but what actually it's doing it's doing the damage damage the kidney by blocking filtration at the glomerulus so this filtration process is actually blocked here causes of post renal azotemia include now we want to know the cause so causes of post renal azotemia it may be prostate hypertrophy or cancer that can cause obstruction right if it's a case of a stone in the ureter if it's a case of cervical cancer if it's a case of urethral structure all of them can lead to obstruction neurogenic or atonic bladder in case of retroperitoneal fibrosis look for bleomycin or methysogyro radiation in the history these are all the thing in the history we can always exclude in order to say that this is retroperitoneal fibrosis and because of the retroperitoneal fibrosis we are seeing this post renal azotemia in our patient management of pre renal and post renal azotemia is based on correcting the underlying cause so this is point to ponder we actually what we are going to do we need to correct the underlying cause that is the management goal for these patients those who are having pre renal and post renal azotemia now pre renal and post renal azotemia combined account for 80% of acute kidney so whether it's pre renal or whether it's post renal both of them can account for 80% 80% of acute kidney injuries and the majority are reversible because the ischemia ischemia is always reversible it should not go into infarction because when it's lead to infarction it will be irreversible injury but ischemia is always reversible you must obstruct both kidneys for the creatinine to rise definitely if there obstruction you are going to see increase in level of creatinine the major force favoring filtration is the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillary of course so the major force favoring filtration what is the force which actually favors filtration that is hydrostatic pressure hydrostatic pressure where in the glomerular capillary if hydrostatic pressure in bowel space rises you cannot filter fluid definitely uh, you know for the filtration the pressure should be low so if hydrostatic pressure in bowel space rises you cannot filter fluid unilateral obstruction causes renal failure if there is unilateral obstruction patient always can lead to renal failure and if the person has only one kidney so that also you know uh, that may cause renal failure because of the obstruction so we can say because of the obstruction patient can goes into renal failure now if there is intrinsic renal disease because we have three things versus pre renal post renal and if it's inside the kidney there is intrinsic renal disease the most common cause is acute tubular necrosis from toxin of prolonged ischemia of the kidney see the most common cause is acute tubular necrosis from toxins toxin are the basic thing or prolonged ischemia these two things are the major responsible factors for creating intrinsic azotemia means there is pathology there is something wrong there is in increased blood urea nitrogen and creatinine because of pathology inside the kidneys and what are the causes of what are the causes that actually leads to this pathology 
those may be toxins and those may be because of prolonged ischemia glomerulonephritis glomerulonephritis is really acute but when the kidney is injured from any cause there is always a greater risk of aki so usually glomerulonephritis is really caused because of this but if it's there then definitely the the patient is having more chances of getting this acute kidney injury because of glomerulonephritis for example a few hours of hypertension might not damage a normal kidney at all but with underlying renal damage it may cause aki in normal cases if there is few hours of hypertension that doesn't make any difference but if the patient is having already something inside or underlying renal damage and in that case if you just you know put your patient uh, you know if, uh, uh, if towards this few hours of hypertension then what will happen there will be there will be aki there will be acute kidney injury in normal circumstances it's okay but if the patient is already having you know something damage inside normal kidney then we can say the few hours of hypertension can lead to acute kidney injury the kidney in pre renal and post renal disease would function normally if transplanted into another person the kidney the the your patient's kidney if it's in its case of pre renal or post renal disease if you trans you know if you're going to transplant this kidney so definitely would function normally if transplanted into another person because there is nothing related to inside the kidney but if there is intrinsic pathology definitely that is going to create a problem if you're going to transplant it now acute allergic interstitial nephritis commonly from medications such as penicillin so penicillin is the culprit for causing this acute allergic interstitial nephritis and what we are going to see there will be increased eosinophils that that is very pathognomonic for allergic interstitial nephritis and then rhabdomyolysis and hemoglobin urea that is also you know that we are actually uh, discussing the causes of acute kidney injury right so rhabdomyolysis and hemoglobin urea that can also cause this thing yeah actually we are doing this intrinsic renal disease right so this rhabdomyolysis and hemoglobin urea these are the causes of this intrinsic renal disease and that will eventually lead into azotemia contrast agent aminoglycosides cisplatin amphotericin cyclosporine and says these are also most common toxin causing acute kidney injury from acute tubular necrosis so acute tubular necrosis that can also lead to acute kidney injury and what are the causes the causes may be contrast agent may be aminoglycoside use of cisplatin amphotericin cyclosporine and said they actually cause intrinsic renal pathology that lead to acute tubular necrosis and because of that you're going to see acute kidney injury all linked together crystals such as hyperuricemia hypercalcemia or hyperoxaluria that can also lead to intrinsic pathology intrinsic azotemia proteins such as bangs jones protein from multiple myeloma case that can also lead to intrinsic renal disease post streptococcal infection inside the kidney that can lead to in, uh, this intrinsic azotemia now point to ponder ct angiogram is dangerous in a patient with borderline renal function why we are not why we are not opting for the angiogram because in, we are going to use contrast media in that case and remember in any renal pathology contrast media is always nephrotoxic so we are not going to use it at all now we are going to summarize is that acute kidney injury is etiology is we have pre renal we have inside the kidney cause that is intrinsic renal and we have the post renal so in case of pre renal that may be because of hypertension and hypertension may be because of sepsis and aphylaxis bleeding dehydration that can all lead to hypertension and hypertension can lead to pre renal azotemia this chart is very important for the memorization hypovolemia because maybe because of the use of diuretic the patient can lead into hypovolemia and hypovolemia is responsible for pre renal azotemia in case of burns in case of pancreatitis decreased pump function like congestive heart failure pericarditis or tamponade patient that can also lead to pre renal azotemia in case of hypoalbuminemia in case of cirrhosis you are going to see this we have all you know done with the uh, in, in paragraph but they are just going to summarize it here in the chart also this is very important so just learn this one renal artery stenosis or in case of congestive heart failure these are all the causes of pre renal azotemia that can lead to acute kidney injury then we have this intrinsic renal causes intrinsic renal causes include acute tubular necrosis that because of 
toxins. Toxins that what actually cause this tubular necrosis may be the use of NSAIDs, amino glycosides, antibiotic, amphotericin, cisplatin, cyclosporine. These are all the medications that can be toxic towards the kidney and can cause acute tubular necrosis and can cause acute kidney injury. And these are considered to be the cause of intrinsic azotemia. Then prolonged ischemia that can also lead to intrinsic renal disease. Acute interstitial nephritis because of the use of penicillin and sulfur drugs. If the patient is having is, is on sulfur drugs or penicillin, that can cause acute interstitial nephritis and that definitely can cause acute kidney injury or intrinsic that can cause intrinsic azotemia as well. Rhabdomyolysis, hemoglobin urea, use of contrast media, crystals, benzones, protein, post optical infection that can all lead to intrinsic pathology and that will be the cause for acute kidney injury. Then we have this post renal azotemia. Post renal azotemia is benign, the cause are actually benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostate cancer. We will see. In, in post renal think all all of these stones structures and cancers usually obstruction right so that can cause post renal cervical cancer stone neurogenic bladder retroperitoneal fibrosis because of the use of chemotherapy or external beam therapy that can lead to retroperitoneal fibrosis and that is the cause of post renal azotemia so think of stones structures this fibrosis right in case of post renal now how your patient is going to present if he is or she is having acute kidney injury aki may present with only an asymptomatic rise in blood urine nitrogen and creatinine there must not be symptoms your patient may be asymptomatic but when you see there is rise in blood urine nitrogen or creatinine when symptomatic the patient feels if symptoms are there the patient might be complaining of nauseating or vomiting there may be tired nasal malaise or weak shortness of breath and has edema from fluid overload if there is fluid overload definitely the patient will be presenting as short of breath and has the edema very severe disease present with confusion arrhythmia from hyperkalemia and acidosis but that's a case of very severe disease with confusion if the potassium is very high that can lead to arrhythmia and acidosis can also be there sharp pleuritic chest pain from pericarditis pericarditis is one of the cause right so that can also lead to your presentation will be sharp irritating chest pain there is no pathognomic physical finding of aki mostly patients are asymptomatic but if they are symptomatic that can you know also give you a clue for the tip no symptoms are specific enough to answer the most likely diagnosis question without lab testing of course you need to go for the lab testing in order to make a correct diagnosis Presentation of post renal azotemia. So, if the patient is having post renal azotemia, how your patient is going to present? There will be enlargement or distension of the bladder and massive diuresis. It's post renal. So, you are going to see massive diuresis after Foley's urinary catheter placement are specific to urinary obstruction. So, there were, when you just put this uh, Foley's catheter, if it's a case, if it was a case of obstructions, definitely you are going to see massive diuresis just after inserting this Foley's catheter. This is the closest you will get uh, to a specific presentation for any form of acute kidney injury. Now, for the diagnostic testing, the best initial test is the blood urine nitrogen and creatinine. You must know the best initial test for acute kidney injury is blood urine nitrogen and creatinine with completely dead kidneys. The creatinine will rise about 1.1 milligram per deciliter a day with completely dead kidneys the creatinine will rise about one point that is one milligram per deciliter a day if the uh, bun and creatinine ratio is above 20 to 1 the etiology is either pre-renal or post-renal damage of the kidney so whenever there is 20 to 1 ratio of bun and creatinine you will say this is pre-renal or post-renal if it's a case of intrinsic renal disease it should has a ratio closer to 10 is to 1 so 10 is to 1 it should be intrinsic one 20 is to 1 it may be pre or post renal renal sonogram is the best initial imaging testing see for the imaging testing the best one is renal sonogram but for the best initial lab testing is blood urine nitrogen and creatinine sonography does not need contrast always contrast is nephrotoxic and contrast should be avoided in renal insufficiency now pre-renal for the pre-renal azotemia is usually a clear diagnosis with the question describing say for example if the question says like blood urine nitrogen and creatinine ratios above 20 is to 1 
it will give you a clue that this is a case of pre-renal azotemia and the clear history of hyperperfusion or hypertension if there is a history of hypertension if there is a history of hyperperfusion that will definitely give you a clue so for the pre-renal diagnosis you have to check for the bun creatinine ratio it should be above 20 is to 1 and your patient history includes hypertension or hyperperfusion then you will say clearly it's a case of pre-renal azotemia in case of post-renal azotemia, post-renal azotemia is usually a clear diagnosis with a question describing there the ban creatinine ratio is the same that is above 20 is to 1 but in order to say this is a case of post-renal you should think that there must be the standard bladder or massive release of urine with catheter placed and once you put a catheter you will see a massive diuresis because previously there was obstruction so that gives a clear clue that this is a case of post-renal azotemia. For pre-renal, it should be something related to hypertension and hyperperfusion. The rest of the things are same, like bun and creatinine ratio will be 20 is to 1, above 20 is to 1. And when you go for the bilateral, unilateral hydronephrosis, you will do the sonography, you will do the ultrasound, you will confirm your hydronephrosis, either unilateral or bilateral is there. So definitely it's a case of post-renal azotemia. Now we're coming towards drug that raise creatinine in normal renal function. Some medication give the false impression of renal injury by elevating creatinine. But actually the pathology is not there. That, that's only because of the use of those drugs that can you know, actually lead to increase in amount of creatinine in blood. And these drugs inhibit creatinine secretion in the proximal tubule. So that's why if secretion is inhibited, the creatinine more will be in the blood. And you are going to see more amount of creatinine in the blood because of the use of those medicine say for example trimethoprim or fibroxistat or simetidine these are the medications that can actually inhibit creatinine secretion in the proximal tubule so that creatinine will not be excreted in the urine the ratio of the creatinine in the blood inside the blood will be high and you must and you must confuse with this that oh the patient must be having any kidney pathology but there is no kidney pathology right because these medications are there and they are the culprit they can cause increase amount of creatinine because of its decreased secretion in the proximal tubule now tip for us is kidney biopsy is really the right answer for AKI we, ne we, we usually never go for the kidney biopsy if it's a case of acute kidney injury although the biopsy is the most accurate test of allergic interstitial nephritis or post trapezococcal glomerular nephritis we have the most accurate one that is biopsy but we usually make a diagnosis on the basis of best initial and next best step so we'll never go for the biopsy. It is rare for either of these to test actually need biopsy. Now test for acute kidney injury of unclear etiology. Now test for AKI of unclear. So I think we should start this from tomorrow uh, because time for recall session. So it's okay. We'll continue tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye.